Yes, we are coming home. I'm so excited about that. Next week, friends, we are excited to, to welcome you and your friends, others that can come. Now, I know a lot will not be able to come. Uh, we know that. Or a lot will choose not to come. You know, many are wearing masks. Many are not wearing masks. We're going to be wearing masks. This is not your office, not your school, not even your home. This is the church. And so we're asking everyone to wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, then continue to join us here online. But we are excited about coming home. You can find a, uh, a video online. Uh, it's out there right now that our own Christian Scott put together, our team put together, and it'll walk you through everything you need to know about coming back on campus. Also, uh, next week, we're having uh, Lord's Supper. We thought no better way to gather than to share in the Lord's Supper. We have a, a wonderful, safe way to do that, but we also have an opportunity for those of you who would like to drive through. Uh, you can find information there online as well. Uh, that's from 5 to 6.30 next week if you want to come. We'll be here. Ministers will be here to serve you and to bless you. But we are so thrilled. Many members of our, even our medical team are here who've helped guide us and, and our task force, Restart Team, uh, are here today. And they have done an incredible job uh, with, uh, with great love for you in mind, with wisdom. And I think that we are ready. Now, today, of course, you're home. Maybe you're, maybe you're home. Maybe you're sitting in your favorite couch or in your comfy chair. Maybe you're outside watching this somewhere. You're just chilling. But here's the thing. We're going to get active today, okay? I'm going to take you on a climb. We're going we're gonna to go on the climb of all climbs. We're going to take the climb uh, that is the highest climb for the Christian. This is the Mount Everest of climbs in the Christian life. Today, we're going to talk about the singular trait Okay, the, the primal foundational essence of who God is and, and who he has called us to be. Okay, how he's called us to live. Now, you may guess if, you're, you know, if I were to ask you, hey, who is God? What is he like? What's his primal, you know, foundational uh, essence and characteristic? Uh, you'd probably say, well, he's love. And you'd be right. Love is, we're saying, grace in action. As we walk through... Uh, the fruit of the Spirit last week, if you were with us, we, we went through all of them and we're assigning a certain fruit so that you, your children, all of us can, when we see that fruit, we'll remember, okay, the trait, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And today, of course, is the watermelon. We noted last week that uh, the watermelon is the biggest of them all, most amazing, you could argue, of all, because I can take this little seed, this little watermelon seed you can't even see right here. And you put this in the ground, it becomes this, okay? Uh, the watermelon is like 92% water. It hydrates, it nourishes the body, and it draws us together, doesn't it? I'm just guessing this summer that you uh, maybe had a moment. Maybe it's 4th of July. Maybe it was out the lake or by the pool or something. And you were eating watermelon with people you love. A watermelon does that. Love does that. So we're going to be talking about, and by the way, if you didn't see that sermon uh, last week, go back and you can go back to each one that we assign a particular fruit to. We're calling these calling cards of faith. Each one is a calling card to say, here's who I am. Here's who I'm affiliated with. This is my team. This is my tribe. I live like this. I want my life to be marked by these things. So we're all memorizing uh, verses along the way. And the primary verse throughout this whole series is, of course, Galatians 5, 22, 23. You can see it there. In fact, wherever you are right now, let's say this together. All right. But the fruit of the spirit is, let's go, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, right? Self-control against such things. There is no law. He's saying that, hey, there, don't put boundaries around this. It's meant to be limitless. Uh, legalism is not going to help you. In fact, it's only going to get in the way. He says, this is freedom to live like this. So these words should mark us. Each one of these words should mark us as God's people. All right. So today we're going on a climb. We're going to take it all the way to the top. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to raise your hand. Even if you're alone, you can raise your hand. How many of you have actually done some uh, mountain hiking? Anybody, anybody done any some, some climbing? Anybody? Okay, how many of you, uh, is anybody, kind of the mark, the standard of the mountain climber is the 14er? Anybody ever climbed a 14er? Anybody? Okay. I'm not talking about like driving to the peak and then walking over to the marker. I'm, I'm talking about like from the trailhead, you've climbed a 14er. Now, I've done a few 14ers in my lifetime, but Dr. Tyler Cooper, a friend of mine, member of our church, 
over at the Cooper Aerobic Center, he has climbed 73 of the 74. Uh, 14ers in the continental U.S., okay? He's got one more to go in California. He's asked me if I'll go with him. I may have to do this. I don't know which one it is, so maybe, maybe not. We'll see about this. But uh, some of you are like a 14er, and some of you are sitting at home right now. Um, you've been chilling on your couch, and you're like, man, I would die trying. I mean, I, I don't think so, okay? And, and, and literally, some people do. We know that every year... People die trying to climb certain 14ers. I saw that over 200 people now have died trying to climb climb Mount Everest just to get to the peak, and they've died trying. And I'm going to submit to you this morning that, that this kind of love that God has called us to, that though we may not get there in our lifetime to love just like Jesus, he's called us to die trying. He's called us to literally die trying to live like this. And so I've chosen a passage, could have gone all over the scriptures uh, to find a passage, but we're going to look at Luke chapter 6. Would you turn there? Have your Bible, Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36 is our text for the day. And I want you to, to go there. Let's dive into the scripture. We're going to seek to apply this message to our lives. Now I'm going to tell you straight up, hang on. Hang on, because today we're going to, we're going to see that, that if we're to love like Jesus, watch this, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work, it doesn't pay off, and it doesn't end, all right? This is the radical, illogical, scandalous love of Christ that he's called us to live. So this is my charge to you. After receiving the grace of Jesus, after you've accepted his love and his forgiveness for you, then all of love is a response, all of life is a response to his love for us. Right? Everything we do is a response to his love. And so after we receive Christ, this is it. This is the Christian life, to love like Jesus. Now, I know we all we talk about how love is a verb, and I'm going to use it that way. I'm going to use it as a noun as well, because the noun form, love, like Jesus, I'm saying that love is personified in the person of Jesus. And listen, if you're not a Christian, okay, and you're listening in. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, if you're still a seeker, you're trying to understand what it is to follow Christ, I want you to hear today. I want you to hear this. I'm going to make the case that Jesus is the model and he embodies love. He shows us how to be fully human. And even in saying that, I'm going to tell you, as we look at this passage, I'm going to say, buckle up. This is a steep climb. This is a steep climb. And even saying that it's radical, I think oftentimes implies that, hey, that's some crazy love. We read about Jesus. That is radical when you're going to say, you're going to, you're going to be tempted to think this way. Jeff, of course he loves like that. Of course, this is Jesus talking about love. I'm not Jesus. He's the son of God. Of course his love is perfect. And listen, he's called us to live exactly like him. He's called us to be like him. What Jesus calls radical no, what we call radical. Jesus calls normal in the Christian life. He says, this is the way I want you to live. And again, if you're not a Christian and you're just kind of peering in or maybe you're still, again, you're on the journey. I want you to know this. If you have, have been hurt by people who claim to be Christians, maybe in, in your own home, hurt in deep ways, maybe in your own family, in extended friends, maybe in relationship, people who claim to be believers and they've not loved you and they have hurt you. I want to say just for all of us, I want to say I'm sorry. And if believers have, have not loved you uh, well, if we've been unkind, unforgiving, I want to say I'm sorry. Because that's not who Christ has called us to be. But I want to say this, there is hope. There's hope for each of us that we can grow to love like him. And that is the Christian life. This is the climb, okay? But the problem for many of us is, that we have this Jesus in our minds that we've either seen or been taught. And it's not the one who confronts us in scripture. It's the one that we're going to see today is the one who calls us to be, watch this, just like him. Now I'm old enough like some of you to remember uh, Michael Jordan when he was playing basketball. And by the way, the last dance kind of helped me survive this, this quarantine early on. But there was a song, you might remember it, right? Gatorade had this ad that came out. What was it? I want to be like Mike, right? I want to be like Mike. 
and you to get in your head and want to be like Mike. Uh, if I could be like Mike, all the kids want to be like Mike. I remember I'm like, I want to be like Mike. Here's the thing as believers today, as Christians, we want to be like Jesus. That's the goal of our lives. And in Luke chapter 6, Jesus has been uh, reiterating the Beatitudes. We see them here. This vision of a new kingdom that just blows our minds. You look at the, you look at the, the, uh, the Beatitudes and you just stop and go, I don't even know what to do with this. I don't even know how to live like this. And yet he's calling us to live this way. And then he enters into woes. The next section, he has these woes against the proud and the rich. You can see him there. Those who are happy now, he says, at the expense of others. Woe to you. And these are strong words to, from Jesus. And then in verse 27, he says, but I say to you who hear, and this is a way of like turning his attention to his followers. Okay, now he focuses on, on those who claim to follow him. All right, so he's saying those who are, now you, now you all, I'm turning here in the room and those, as many of you watching, now those who are really listening in view of obedience, now listen to me. Blessed, he says. No, watch this. Love your enemies. That's the first thing he says. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. What? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Wait. Really? Look at the progression there. For those who are really listening, in view of, of, of obedience, listen. He, he's, saying, he's saying this, and I'll say that love like Jesus doesn't make sense. That's the first thing we, we realize here. It's illogical. This is enemy love. Blessing those who curse you, praying for your abusers. Are you serious? Who does this? Anyone who claims to follow Jesus. That's who does this. Who loves like this? Anyone who has received his grace. That's who. In his book, Dismissing Jesus, Subtitled, How We Evade the Way of the Cross, Douglas M. Jones writes this in his thesis. The dominant form of Christian living is one designed to shield us from Jesus' explicit priorities. How is it that the vast majority of Christians set aside Jesus' obvious and revolutionary call so easily? How do we make disobedience and blindness so normal and acceptable? The way of Jesus is the way of enemy love. It's the way of renunciation. It's the way of sharing in astounding ways. It's the way of forgiveness. And in applying this message today, I want you to think about people you, maybe you don't love them. I mean, some of us had a hard time. Enemies, I don't know if I have any enemies. Listen, who do you need to forgive? Who in your life do you need to love? We're talking about a preemptive, radical kind of love. Jones writes this. Christians don't believe in love. We don't believe love is a serious and thick force in the cosmos. A power that actually topples things. Love can't move mountains, we assume. We deny love is lightning that can explode trees or a dense river that cuts through granite. We even believe soft tissue humans are stronger than love. We prefer intimidation and punishment to change people. Do you really believe in love? In every relationship you're in, do you really believe, watch this, that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger? Now, if it, when most of us see the latter part of that, because we see that in spades in our day, but do we really believe that a gentle answer turns away wrath. In this cultural moment, listen, your desire, this is a word for many of us, your desire to love must be stronger than your desire to be right. Love is what wins the day. Many of us have long since jeopardized our, our ability or right to be heard because we have not been loving. And we see this from so many who claim to be Christians seeking to win some biased argument. Some of us will hear in this message today, we're going to hear, oh, yeah, but Jeff, what about, or this is what we do, we rationalize, oh, you don't know, but they're crazy. I mean, this person, that opinion or whatever, or this, Jeff, you don't understand, this person in my family, I mean, this, no, you don't know what they have done for me, what you, what about, we go on and on, Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, keep posing questions and you will escape the necessity of obedience. 
He's called us to love. And Jesus goes on, look at verse 29. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from, from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Here's the next thing I want you to see. Love like Jesus doesn't work. It's impractical. It's not pragmatic. It, it seems like it's something that will, you know, that, that will not help us succeed, right? This is not going to help me get ahead. This is not going to, and, and among a pragmatic people, he, he's, he's, saying, he, he's saying here, uh, listen, you're going to love in radical ways that will astound people around you. And in so doing, as we'll see, it's going to point them to me. Do you really believe this? Now, he's not saying let evil go on. He's using some hyperbolic language. Now, the moment I say that, no, oh, it's hyperbole. Okay, good. Whew, I thought he was serious for a moment. He's serious. The, the hy hyperbolic language is to, is to wake us up to this radical kind of love. He's not, stay, he's not saying stay in abusive relationships. He's not, he's not saying, you know, give everything away. You give away your cloak and your tunic. You're walking around, sorry, you're walking around naked. I mean, Jesus didn't do this. He didn't give everything away. He had little. And what he had, he shared. But he's not saying just stay in an abusive relationship. Listen, domestic violence of any kind needs to end, right? You need to end that, stop that relationship. In fact, there's an interesting uh, moment in, in John 18 where Jesus is actually, he's talking to the high priest. And, and someone standing there, an official beside him, actually slaps him in the face. And he doesn't say, wow, that kind of hurt. Here, hit me on this side. Now, ultimately, he went to the cross, but he, and he confronted the person. He said, I, I, if I'm speaking a lie, you point that out to me. Why do you hit me, he said, was the first thing he said. So he's not saying don't, you don't ever defend yourself and he, or, or there's just war at times, perhaps. There, but what he's saying is um, anybody who has this attitude that says nobody gets the best of me is not the spirit of Jesus. In fact, one of my favorite songwriters, John Guerra, writes about the traits of the kingdom. And, and in his song, he says, love comes in many disguises, but winning is simply not won. And we so want to have the upper hand. Love like Jesus is impractical, but he's not saying, you, hey, hit me once, hit me again. Have you seen this, this new sport? Um, it's on ESPN, or you can go, you can YouTube for the rest of the afternoon. Enjoy and thank me later. It's a sport where big, giant men stand in front of each other and slap each other as hard as they can. Have you seen this? And whoever is left standing is the winner. This is the thing. Uh, and yet, he's, and this Jesus is saying, don't do that. Okay, this is not what we're talking about here. And again, abuse in relationships must end. He's saying, here's what he's saying. I mean, the ultimate, right? The ultimate offense is someone slapping you in the face. And it was in this culture. The ultimate offense. When someone offends you, you don't respond in like, in like kind. When someone offends you, you respond, watch this, in a way in which you can minister to them. You respond in a way that you can love them. And if somebody needs your coat, you've got three, give them one. If someone has nothing to eat and you've got a lot of food, share what you have. And watch this. He's saying, share what you have without any need or, or view towards them now giving back to you. Right? And so here's my application for us today. And I want you to think about this. When's the last time you shared something knowing that that person could not give you anything in return? Because our, our love is so often that way. The application is this for the week. Seek out someone to love. Think about them even now. Whom you can love, express love to. Knowing ahead of time they will do nothing. Give nothing back in return. Okay? Jesus goes on. Look at this in verse 31. We know this as the golden rule. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Again, in real life, we don't think this works. We're always, well, I'll see what the other one does. Some of you in strained relationships right now. You know, that person, I haven't talked to him in years, or, or you know, I'm having to challenge with this person in my family, or maybe it's a spouse. I'll wait, and when they, come, when they turn to me, I will then do what they, I'll, I'll make a move. Okay, but they better make that, look, instead, the love of Jesus is preemptive love. Always preemptive love. 
It's, it's, it's truly one-way love. The golden rule says, in every circumstance and situation, if I were in their shoes, how would I want someone to treat me? If I were in their circumstance, what would I want someone to do for me? In every situation, I will do that now, is what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. He's contrasting this alternative vision of life for those who live and love in the new community, in the kingdom that he's called us to live in. This is how we distinguish ourselves. So I want you to see this. Look at this. Love like Jesus doesn't pay off. It's not reciprocal. It's not getting something back like a payment. It's not, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And in this age of of contractual agreements and litigation, we need to remember that the love of Jesus, agape love is not contractual. It's covenantal, ultimately, but it's not contractual. It's not signing all the, you know, signing this, all these signatures. Got to do this so that if I do this, you'll do this and promise this. Listen, most of our actions, even loving actions, are reciprocal actions. We do this in, in, the, in the highest, deepest of relationships. I did a wedding this past weekend, and a few weeks ago, I met with a couple, as I do often, this young couple, and hear all about, well, I love him because he makes me feel so good, and she loves me because uh, she just helped me fulfill my dreams, and I like who I am when I'm around her. You know, you go on and on, and what you, you realize is uh, I do the same. Wow, you are loving, wow, that, for a lot of selfish reasons is why you love them. For what they will do for you. And then a year later, right? Five years later, I'm sitting in my office. I'm meeting with this couple. Ten years later, he's not all that. She's not making me happy anymore. We talk about this all the time. Marriage is not to make you happy. It's to make you holy. It's like every relationship, single, married or not. It's every relationship that we're in. Is a Christ-centered, one-way love from the believer. It's not based on reciprocity. It's based on this love that is like Jesus because that's how he loves us. Look at verse 35. But love your enemies. Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. Now watch this. And you will be sons of the most high, sons and daughters of the most high king. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as, just as your father is merciful. Now, friends, listen, you're seeing it here. And and again and again, Jesus spoke clearly, uh, openly about the way of loving our enemies. And yet this this way of enemy love is something so counter, it runs so countercultural to our daily lives, we find it unnatural because it is. It's why it's called a fruit, a produce, a result of the Spirit of God. You can't do this if you don't know Christ. You can't do it if you don't have the Spirit of God. This does not work in our Newtonian world. This does not work in this world of Aristotle's cause and effect. This is a love that can make people crazy, but what's happened because it doesn't seem to work, it's not pragmatic for us. It's not self-centered in the end. Christians have conspired for centuries to set aside Jesus' craziness, taming him for our own modern sensibilities. So Christians rant and rave, often now in our days, about their beliefs which come in political talking points and we wonder why we've lost the power and impact in our world. Because our superpower, friends, listen, is love. Love is the superpower. And still the words of Jesus echo forth out of the madness. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? 
How long will you go on in a relationship that is unkind and unloving, unforgiving? Friends, we can change the world. When we realize, here it is, here's what he's saying, love like Jesus doesn't end. Love like Jesus is not terminal. In other words, it doesn't terminate on the act. Watch this. It doesn't even terminate on the person that we're loving. This is the crazy thing about Christian love. It's not about the love. It's not about, it's about something else. Watch this. It's about someone else. We talk about this in, in marriage. Again, marriage is gospel reenactment. The crazy thing about marriage, Christian marriage, is it's not about the marriage. And Paul says in Ephesians 5, it's about Christ and his church. And every act of love is to point others to him. This is what the scripture is saying. Jesus is saying we love because the Father has loved us this way. And when we love, every act of love today, friends, every act of love, every word of love, is an act of love that points people to the heavenly Father whose love for us never ends. Our acts of love point to the eternal God who is love. In fact, it's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love, literally, love never ends, he says. And so our memory verse this week is 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Okay, that one's easy. Let's all say it. Okay, the reference, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. And so everything that we do, everything that we do is an act of love towards our great Savior because he's loved us. Now watch this. How has he loved us? Okay, Romans 5, 8 says, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were at our worst, okay, not because we had cleaned ourselves up or we gotten better or, or, or he, we, he waited till we moved first, he came to us. And this is the preemptive love of Jesus. This is what he's called us to do in Romans 5, 8. And it, it's across the scriptures, right? You and I, Watch this. This is amazing. This hit me this week and it kind of just wrecked me. The greatest act of love, you think about that. The greatest act of love, what was it? In all of history, Christians of course know this, the greatest act of love, the moment of love, is when Christ died on the cross for our sin. He took upon himself our sin so that we would be forgiven. He took upon himself our shame, punishment, so that we wouldn't have to face that kind of judgment. He took it upon himself. But here's what blew me away. And for you to understand this today, and if you're not a believer, not a Christian, listen, you need to know this. The greatest act of love, God's affection and his attention, his action was toward you. The greatest act of love was targeted towards me. It just blows my mind. God of the universe came in the form of Jesus and he, he died and he did it for us. So friends, we're on a climb. Jesus is being clear. We are called to live this life, this life of love. And it is a long climb. And the truth is in this lifetime, we'll never get there, but we will die trying. But we know this, we were singing earlier, my Jesus, I love thee. You know, if, if, if ever I loved you, like I've never loved you more than right now. Every time I sing that, I'm like, I don't know if I can really say that. I mean, am I really believing that? I want it. It's aspiring. I want to be able to sing, I love you now more than I ever have. But I know this. He loves me more with a perfect love. His love doesn't change. We love him. Because he loves us. And so, friends, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask you, if you've not received Christ, to do so now. And then all of us to pray. Say, Lord, change my heart. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Friends, right where you are right now, you've got to apply this message. Because love is an action. So, Lord, I pray that each of us will come to grasp your great love more and more every single day. Because in so doing, we respond with obedience. It's the only natural, really supernatural, spiritual response. 
And friend, if you're listening right now with your head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you, if you never received Christ, you can do it right now. Receive his grace by faith, not by works. Praise God. But because of all he's done for you, you can just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving me of my sin. I'm sorry. I give my life to you. Thank you for loving me with an astounding love. And now, Lord, I give you my life and I pray that you will help me to love others as you have loved me. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.